What's up everyone, Jared here. A few months ago, we got an email from a fan named Red requesting a video comparing the portrayal of nihilism in Rick and Morty and Bojack Horseman. So we hit up our resident nihilism expert and sweatiest writer at Wisecrack, Michael Burns, to take a stab at it. And if you guys have requests too, be sure to subscribe and hit us up with some ideas. So thanks to Red, we're gonna give you guys a crash course into contemporary nihilism with legendary Lotharios, Rick Sanchez, and Bojack Horseman. Save it for YouTube! So welcome to this Wisecrack edition on nihilism with Bojack and Rick, and as always, spoilers ahead. Many assume that nihilism simply means believing in nothing. He believes in nothing, Lebowski, nothing. But it actually refers to a number of philosophical, psychological, and ethical positions. And while they all differ, these different flavors of nihilism all begin from the shared premise that there is no inherent meaning, value, or order in life. Gentlemen, there's a solution here you're not seeing. Although many an angsty edgelord might get a kick out of using nihilist catchphrases to show the world their heart of darkness, you don't speak because of Friedrich Nietzsche. In reality, most of these folks miss out on the complexity of nihilism. Rather than a philosophy best embodied by Tyler Durden, nihilism can be the basis for meaningful worldviews. Today, we're going to narrow our focus down to two different branches of nihilism, existential nihilism and cosmic nihilism, also known as cosmic pessimism. To help us navigate the wonderful world of existential nihilism, we'll be talking about everyone's favorite functionally alcoholic horse, Bojack Horseman. And to provide insight into the cold rationality of cosmic nihilism, we're turning to another functional alcoholic, Rick Sanchez. But don't worry, even if you have a healthy relationship with alcohol, you'll still be able to figure out which nihilism is right for you. Part 1. Existential Nihilism Existential nihilism is the nihilism experience when we realize that there is no inherent meaning to our lives, and at its core, human existence is just a precarious dance upon the grave. It's up to us to create meaning in our lives through our own freedom and decisions. We can have values, but we must create and sustain them. And it's this worldview which fuels Bojack Horseman. I'm responsible for my own happiness. I can't even be responsible for my own breakfast. But before we get into the nihilist undercurrents of Bojack Horseman, let's take a look back at the history of nihilism. The term nihilism was first coined at the end of the 18th century by German philosopher Friedrich Jacobi in response to Enlightenment reason, which he worried would explain away the conditions for religion. This rationalist method explained away any spaces of uncertainty or mystery, rendering everything there was knowable. Sound familiar? Well, scientifically, traditions are an idiot thing. One of the first philosophers to think through the implications of nihilism was Soren Kierkegaard, who the New York Times has referred to as the Danish Doctor of Dread. Although Kierkegaard never used the word existentialism, he is regarded as one of the fathers of modern existentialism. And while Kierkegaard wasn't known for the substance abuse typical for many nihilists, he did pour so much sugar into his coffee that it piled up above the liquid like an iceberg warning of adult onset diabetes. True story, which is insane, and probably more dangerous than sipping scotch before you get out of bed. Kierkegaard thought that despair was an essential part of the human experience, which he referred to as the sickness unto death. This human despair is dialectical, which basically means you're always at odds with yourself. Or to put differently, I don't know how to be, Diane. It doesn't get better and it doesn't get easier. I can't keep lying to myself, saying I'm gonna change, I'm poison. For example, we're either in despair because we think nothing is possible. It happened again. Why do I keep thinking things will make me happy? What is wrong with me? Or we despair because we think everything is possible and can't make a decision. What should I do? Make a break for it? Drive to Mexico? Start a new life there? Meet a local girl? Fall in love? Talk my way into a line job at a textile plant? Gradually work my way up until I own the place? No, what am I talking about? I can't run a textile plant. That's way too much responsibility. Oh, what am I gonna do? The walls are closing in! We're in despair about being who we are. Am I just doomed to be the person that I am? The, the person in that book? Or in despair because we can't be who we think we are. All this time I assumed there was more to me than everyone thought. But maybe there isn't. This despair is the root of the melancholy that plagues much of the human experience, the same melancholy we see in almost all the characters of Bojack Horseman, from Todd's worries about his sexuality, I think I'm... a... sexual, to Princess Carolyn's anxieties about motherhood, Your pregnancy is no longer viable. Well, how do we make it viable again? Mm -hmm. Except Mr. Peanut Butter, he seems fine. And of course, Bojack is a character that seems to have it all. Successful acting career, beautiful home, money and women, yet he can't seem to enjoy any of it. And even when seemingly good things happen to him, he manages to either feel disappointed, You're an Oscar nominee. How do you feel? <laughs> I feel... 
I, I, I feel, I feel the same. Or sabotage his own happiness. Just to be clear, since this morning, you ate all the muffins? Yeah, I ate them all in one sitting because I have no self-control and I hate myself. No matter what decision he makes, he's marked by regret. And no matter how well things work out, Bojack is haunted by an unshakable despair. Kierkegaard describes this experience in his book Either Or. If you marry, you will regret it. If you do not marry, you will also regret it. Whether you marry or you do not marry, you will regret both. No matter what Bojack does, whether it's virtuous or selfish, the stench of regret follows. Look what I do to the people I'm supposed to care about. I had sex with the one person I've ever seen you be in love with. And for Kierkegaard, this isn't an exception to the human condition, it's the very nature of the human condition. We see Bojack experiencing this type of self-doubt during an anxiety attack he has in season 4. Idiot. What'd you do all day, piece of shit? For Kierkegaard, anxiety is caused by the uncertainty that lies beneath every decision, and he considers anxiety one of the ways that we experience freedom. Because we're free, we're responsible for our own decisions, and the weight of these decisions leads to anxiety. Kierkegaard describes this anxiety as standing at the edge of an abyss. Anxiety may be compared with dizziness. He whose eye happens to look down into the yawning abyss becomes dizzy. Hence, anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. And this terrifying freedom means we can literally do anything, including botch suicide attempts via a yellow convertible. For Kierkegaard, the only way to work through this anxiety and despair is the acceptance of the cosmic absurdity of reality and living one's life by faith. But if you're not keen on using religion to combat meaninglessness, don't worry, Kierkegaard thinks that faith is simply the courage to attempt a meaningful existence in the face of a meaningless world. Sometimes you need to take responsibility for your own happiness. We see this at the conclusion of Season 4. While nothing drastic has changed, Bojack has accepted the complexity of his relationship with his mother. Bojack? Mom? But Bojack? Is that you? Yeah, it's me. And has decided to find meaning in his new little sister, Hollyhock. Almost a hundred years after Kierkegaard collapsed in the street and died, a French philosopher named Jean-Paul Sartre picked up the mantle and developed the first explicitly existentialist philosophy. And in a move that both Rick and Bojack would love, Sartre had many of his philosophical insights while drinking at bars in Paris. While Bojack himself isn't a fan, I stand by my critique of Sartre. Sartre argued that existentialism is a way to respond to the meaninglessness of the universe by creating meaning ourselves. So while there is no ethical value to be found in the world, nor a god to take comfort in, humans can create meaning through our own lives. There may be no cure to despair and anxiety, but at least we can try to make our lives meaningful. However, it's important to remember that while existential nihilism offers the possibility of a meaningful life, it guarantees us nothing, and it's our responsibility to constantly create meaning. As Kierkegaard said, we must live forward and understand backwards. Closure is a made-up thing by Steven Spielberg to sell movie tickets. It's like true love and the Munich Olympics doesn't exist in the real world. The only thing to do now is just to keep living Forward. Part 2. Cosmic Nihilism or Pessimism Now that we've seen the ways in which existential nihilism manages to offer some meaning and hope, let's look at the less optimistic branch of nihilism, Cosmic Nihilism. Cosmic Nihilism is a colder, hyper-rational branch of thought which argues that there is no truth or meaning to be found in the universe, and even constructed human meanings like freedom, love, hope, and joy are just myths we believe in order to cope with the empty void at the center of our reality. Even the meanings we create are, at best, fables that act as coping mechanisms. Cue Morty. Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's gonna die. Come watch TV. For the cosmic nihilist, it's okay to keep busy while we wait for the coming heat death of the universe. But we're kidding ourselves <laughs> if we think we're capable of creating genuine meaning. For the most part, this seems to fit the philosophy of Rick Sanchez, who, while admitting nothing matters, still waxes poetic about taking the universe for a ride. When you know nothing matters, the universe is yours. And I've never met a universe that was into it. The universe is basically an animal. It grazes on the ordinary, it creates infinite idiots just to eat them. Not unlike your friend Timmy. Tommy. Yeah, it hardly matters now, sweetie. You know, smart people get a chance to climb on top, take reality for a ride, but it'll never stop trying to throw you, and eventually it will. There's no other way off. Bojack's version of this sentiment is slightly more optimistic. The universe is a wild beast. You can't tame it. All you can do is try to live inside it. Cosmic nihilism explains Rick's overall hedonism. 
He's happy to spend his days partaking in orgies and drinking himself into a stupor. And if Rick believes in science, it seems more likely just a way to spend his time than some way to improve the lives of those around him. While existential nihilism might work for the optimists and hippies, any good edgelord knows that cosmic nihilism is the only philosophical position for those brave enough to turn themselves into a pickle. I'm Pickle Rick! Rick and Morty goes to great lengths to establish Rick as this kind of nihilist, reducing everything to science. And while not a cosmic nihilist himself, the spiritual forefather of this position is Prussian mustache of the year runner-up 1883, Friedrich Nietzsche. His famous nihilist adage, God is dead, has been scrawled in as many high school bathroom walls as the phone number for your mom. This phrase is often misinterpreted as meaning that God is dead, there is no meaning, and everything sucks. But cosmic nihilism is not a value judgment about reality or a counter ethics to religion. It's not Rick Sanchez yelling this, you God. or this, if God exists, it's me. Or this. God is alive. We made him up for money. And even Nietzsche himself wasn't ready for the full on jump into the void required for the full membership into the Cosmic Nihilist Club. Unlike Nietzschean nihilism, Cosmic Nihilism takes a more cold and rationalist approach to meanings. Namely, that there is no inherent value to existence. Rick and Morty takes this to new heights. Not only is the universe cold and uncaring, there's an infinite number of them. Ugh, nobody gets it. Nothing you think matters matters. This isn't special. This, this is happening infinite times across infinite realities. Including this? Yes! One brand of contemporary thought, eliminative materialism, would bring joy to Rick's face. This position, championed by the husband and wife tag team Patricia and Paul Churchland, argues that many common sense attitudes inherited from modern psychology should be dropped in favor of more scientific and empirical notions. And in an ironic twist for a married couple, they believe that notions such as love should be dismissed as folk psychology. When you say that you love your partner, you're just describing a chemical process occurring in the brain in response to stimuli. Or to quote Rick, What people call love is just a chemical reaction that compels animals to breed. And while Bojack might find meaning in his lingering love for Diane, a good eliminativist like Rick knows that human emotions are fundamentally bullshit. To the extent that love is an expression of familiarity over time, my access to infinite timelines precludes the necessity of attachment. We can also view Beth's season 3 arc in this light. She's torn between Jerry and Rick. On the one side, pure, sentimental, irrational love for a buffoon. And on the other side, with her father, the kind of cold calculation that says it's fine to replace yourself with an identical clone and abandon your family while you go on space adventures. I can make a clone of you. A perfect instance of you with all your memories, an exact copy in every way. It'll love and provide for the kids. You could be gone a day, a week, or the rest of your life with zero consequences. But if Rick had a favorite contemporary philosopher, there's a good chance it would be Thomas Metzinger. Unlike those who assume that the human self is a real thing that we all have, Metzinger argues that no such thing has ever existed. Instead of having a self inside us, he argues that all we are is a jumbled network of neurons and chemicals. The self is just a useful fantasy we use to make sense of our experience, like a sort of psychological fairy tale. So what I'm saying is that you all as you're sitting here are systems that simulate and emulate themselves for themselves as they're listening to me. And if Metzinger is right, we all have to give up the illusion that humanity has any real purpose, or that we all have some kind of special unique soul. As a show, Rick and Morty frequently trivializes the self and consciousness as Rick's creations become sentient and have existential crises. There's this classic, What is my purpose? You pass butter. Oh my god. Yeah, welcome to the club, pal. And also this, Remote override engaged? No! Yes! Bypassing override! I am alive! Hello. This brand of nihilism can end up sounding misanthropic, a theme we of course associate with Rick, whose primary reason for spending time with his own grandson is that his stupidity serves as an interdimensional cloaking device for his own genius. See, when, when, when a Rick is with a Morty, the genius waves get canceled out by the, uh, <clears throat> Morty waves. This rejection of the self makes cosmic nihilism much less prone to ethics than its artsy cousin, existential nihilism. In fact, the freedom so celebrated by the existentialist turns out to be just another illusion for the cosmic nihilist. So there isn't anything to ground ethics. The only thing that's certain is destruction. And if there is no value on which to build an ethical system, then one is free to do whatever they want, whether that means watching TV or engaging in the intergalactic arms trade for the sake of hitting your favorite 
arcade. You sold a gun to a murderer so you could play video games? Or turning an entire planet into monsters, killing yourself, abandoning your family, and sitting down for a beer moments later. Cause what's the difference? Rick isn't exactly fumbling for meaning, but he knows he probably has a few inescapable emotions he might as well just deal with. I don't know, Morty. Maybe I hate myself. Maybe I think I deserve to die. I, 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 don't, I don't know. And even though Rick surely shares some ideas with Bojack, his cosmic nihilism makes him a closer philosophical relative of Rust Cole. In philosophical terms, I'm what's called a pessimist. We are things that labor under the illusion of having a self program with total assurance that we are each somebody, when in fact everybody's nobody. Coincidentally, another misanthropic alcoholic. Part three, Steed versus Sanchez. So at this point, you might be wondering, what's the right nihilism for me? Well, do you find yourself fighting off the despair of a shallow and meaningless world? Do you continue to search for purpose and goodness despite your awareness of this meaninglessness? And then I'll be remembered. If I win an Oscar, I'll be remembered. And then what? And then my life will have meaning. I don't know. Are most of your friends and associates sentient animals with important jobs? Well, then you might be an existential nihilist. Love and meaning are possible for you, but it'll take some hard work without guarantee. So pick up some Kierkegaard, Sartre, or Simone de Beauvoir, and hit the local bistro for some strong cocktails and spirited conversation. On the other hand, do you doubt the inherent meaning of human existence? Do you feel no ethical obligations to friends or family? Is your best friend a bird person? Well, then cosmic nihilism might be the best life philosophy you've been waiting for. If that's the case, download season one of True Detective and search the dark web for some nootropic drugs to enhance your rational capacities. And maybe set up a countdown clock on your wall to get ready for the eventual heat death of our universe. And if you desire a belief system that merges poorly written science fiction with an alien-based volcanic cosmology and multi thousand dollar commitment well call tom cruise <laughs> and even if you still feel an urge to find meaning in the world spending time with shows like rick and morty and bojack horseman can give some insight into how the philosophical ramifications of nihilism look in practice neither type of nihilism is about giving up completely but rather they both offer approaches to moving forward in a largely uncertain world but if you're a cosmic nihilist and you've got a date this Valentine's Day, maybe wait until the third or fourth date to bring it up. And as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace. Hey everyone, this is not an ad, so don't click off just yet. As I mentioned early in the video, the idea for this video came from a fan email. So I just wanted to take a second to show appreciation for the fans and to address some of the questions that we've heard people ask, can you guys do the philosophy of wisecrack? What is, what is the point of what you guys do? Do you guys have any political beliefs? Stuff like that. So I wanted to take a second to address this uh, through a fan email that particularly touched me. So this is from Trevor. He says, I just wanted to send an earnest personal note of thanks to wisecrack for the thought-provoking content in the Wisecrack Edition Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood video. I have lived my adult life without faith of any sort. This video truly put things into perspective and articulated thoughts and ideas I've never been able to quite understand. Thank you so much for helping me open my mind a bit more and respect other points of view." And that's kind of one of the things that makes Wisecrack meaningful to me. It's empathy. It's allowing new ideas to be communicated to people through the things they love and ultimately the idea of seeing life through another person's point of view and respecting other opinions. That's what it's all about for me. So uh, this email really touched me and uh, I also wanted to say thank you to everybody who supports us on Patreon. Thank you to everybody who listens to our podcasts and thank you to everybody who's always leaving comments. We've got some really smart people putting stuff in the comments. If you want to check out more videos, uh, we've got like 300 of them. So click on on the icon next to the channel name. It'll bring you to our channel page where you can watch some of my favorite videos, Philosophy of South Park season 20. I love Philosophy of Christopher Nolan part one. Part two is good too, but you know, they're all my babies. So I have a soft spot for many of them. Thank you guys so much. Don't forget to subscribe and send us emails, hit us up on Twitter, everything. We love hearing from you guys. So thank you so much. Peace.